Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11, we looked at two Sundays ago, the temptation of Christ there in the wilderness. And if you missed that, you can catch up with that Sunday teaching. And so tonight we're gonna pick it up there in verse 12. Matthew chapter four, verse 12. It says, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. John the Baptist, when he was thrown in prison, you know, that was the end really of, you know, his ministry and the beginning of Jesus. John's ba- John the Baptist was the one preparing the way for the Lamb of God. And now that he's in prison, Jesus goes into action. And interestingly, it says he goes into Galilee. Let's talk about Galilee just for a second. Um, the Sea of Galilee is one of our favorite stops uh, when we go to Israel. Uh, and it's an amazing little section of the, of, the, of the land of Israel because so much has happened. In fact, this is a picture from our boat. We go out on a boat there in the Sea of Galilee when we're there. And um, this picture is really important. It's hard to even describe. But see the cliffs of Arbel there on the left? That's, there's some interesting stories. The Romans uh, threw a bunch of uh, people off that cliff back in you know, the first century. There's some, and it's a super tall cliff, and amazing, the cliffs of Arbel. But, but if you look at from where the cliff of Arbel is, and then you go all the way to the left side of that, or well, to the right side of that picture, um, you, you, you can't really see it, but it, it's right there is where the headwaters of the Jordan River flow into the Sea of Galilee. But that little band right there from the cliffs of Arbel to the far right of this picture um, is what we call the Gospel Triangle. And the reason we call it that is there's this, uh, there's this triangle, uh, if you look on a map, going from the Cliffs of Arbel to the edge of this picture, 75% of the gospel narrative happened in that picture right there. And it's an amazing thing. You're just looking at this one section of, your, of the Sea of Galilee uh, and you realize, wow, so much happened there. We're gonna see Capernaum, uh, where Jesus did all those miracles and we're gonna travel along that little coast shore uh, on the Sea of Galilee and, and see all the miracles Jesus did and um, you know, uh, Peter's getting his fish, uh, you know, uh, whether it's overloading of nets or when Jesus was cooking up fish right on the Sea of Galilee. He, he did that right in this gospel. 75% of the story happened right there. So uh, kind of cool. And now Jesus is in, in place to begin the work of ministry to, uh, to really get the, um, the whole ministry that he came to do started. And so verse 12 is kind of a big shifting of gears. John the Baptist is in prison. Now Jesus is here in Galilee, ready to do the work. Verse 13, it says, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt at Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, the land of Zabulon, the land of Naphtali, uh, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and, um, and shadow of death, light is sprung up. <laughs> wow, Jesus just going here to Galilee, uh, to the town of Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum is where Jesus is gonna do more miracles than any other place. Um, and yet they will not believe largely the people of Capernaum and they're gonna be indicted and it's gonna become a curse, this place, Capernaum, because they would reject this light that's being referred to here. We'll get to that as we continue through the gospel narrative. But all that to say, you know, here we see, uh, you know, Jesus leaving Nazareth and going up into Galilee. And by him just doing that, there's so many things that Jesus's life just perfectly fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Um, the prophecy is that Jesus would be, remember uh, all the prophecies said he'd, he'd go from Bethlehem to Egypt, Egypt to Nazareth and grow up in Nazareth and then go from Nazareth into Galilee. These are all things that were foretold by the prophets and Jesus, his you know, path, if you marked it on a map, was perfectly fulfilling uh, uh, the scriptures. Isaiah chapter nine, uh, verses one and two is actually that little scripture where Jesus is fulfilling that, by the way. You can see that in your margin, perhaps written right next to that verse because that's where the prophet Isaiah said that he would do that, fulfilling these prophecies. Now, um, all that to say, here in uh, Matthew chapter four, um, we, we, we continue on where Jesus now is gonna start preaching. It says in verse um, 17, from that time 
uh, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does that sermon sound familiar? Who was preaching that before Jesus? John the Baptist was saying the exact same thing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Interesting how that sermon, the very first thing we hear out of Jesus's, you know, uh, you know, as far as lips, as far as sermon goes, is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I find it interesting that that, that sort of idea is often missing in churches altogether. The idea of repentance. People, people don't like the word repent. And they also don't wanna talk about the kingdom of heaven that's coming because that's prophecy. And you know, as people say, who's got time for prophecy? Like Rick Warren in his Purpose Driven Life. That was, you know, he said a lot of nice things in that book, but there was a lot of things I kind of go, oh boy. Like when he said, you know, prophecy's a waste of time. There's a whole page where he talks about that. And that's the attitude of most of Christianity. Forget Bible prophecy, even though Jesus' first sermon was repent, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's kind of interesting to me that that's lacking in many sermons today, even though that was the first thing Jesus said. But similar to John the Baptist. Then he goes on in verse 18. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. Now, um, this is interesting. Simon Peter and Andrew, they're brothers. Um, and by the way, if you, uh, if you have in you know, uh, your possession, maybe in the back of your Bible or at home, you might have what is called a harmony of the gospels. And we'll, we'll be talking about that as we continue through the gospels. But that's just when you kind of sync up all the gospel narratives and sort of create the full picture of what, what's happening. Just an FYI, if you're doing your math on this, Jesus probably already is acquainted with Peter and Andrew before this part of the narrative, interestingly enough, uh, just so you know. It doesn't say that Jesus doesn't know them, but it also doesn't say that he does know them. But in the other gospels, as you do a timeline, you realize that Jesus may have already been acquainted with Peter and Andrew at this point. But all that to say, Peter and Andrew, what are they doing? Uh, it says in verse 18, they're casting their nets into the sea for they were fishermen. Um, and uh, I want you to notice how, what they were doing with their nets. They were casting them because as we read in verse 19, um, and Jesus, he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Uh, now, this is interesting. It says, and they immediately left their ship and their father, and they followed him. So we see Peter and Andrew, they're casting nets. We see James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they're mending their nets. Uh, what's the big difference? Well, isn't it interesting that Jesus is gonna call these guys into ministry and he's gonna use their already given talents and giftings. Well, what are their talents and giftings? We don't even know these guys yet. Well, we know they're fishermen. And Jesus, he meets us right where we're at. He meets, meets you right where you're at when, with your talents and giftings that he's given you. And by the way, he's kind of an expert. He knows what your talents and giftings are. Um, but this idea of these fishermen, the Lord says, I can use that. I can work with fishermen. And he says, listen, I'm gonna make you fishers of men. But what I find interesting is that these guys, um, as it turns out, um, you know, they, they, um, they both are doing something, just the same thing, but just a little different. And we'll talk about that. Did you know that God wants to use you, I think, in the ways that you're gifted? Um, what was in their hands? Nets, they're fishermen. So God says, I'm gonna use that. What about Moses? What was in his hand? A shepherd's staff, right? And he was gonna be a shepherd of Israel, leading the congregation of Israel. Like, you know, um, it's interesting, in the same way David was a shepherd, but he also had a slingshot in his hand. And the Lord says, I can use a slingshot. I, I, can, I can work with that. Uh, and look what God does with very normal, sort of almost menial type things that we go, yeah, it's not very talented. I'm not very good with that. But, but even in this part of the story, there's kind of an interesting thing that I see here. And it has to do with, um, with sort of how they use their gifting. Um, Peter and Andrew are casting nets. And as it would turn out, if you follow their ministry, Andrew was always seen bringing people to Jesus. That was his thing. He was sort of the net caster when it became to the fishers of men. And same with Peter. Peter, Peter would preach one day. We know the, the end of the story. Peter would preach one day and 3,000 people would come to know Jesus Christ in one day. 
So these are the net casters. But then you look at James and John. John was more of a mystic. Uh, and, and same with James. Uh, and what are they doing? They're mending the nets. And really, James and John were net menders spiritually. You know, it'd be John that would walk around and he was famous after Jesus ascended into heaven, John would go around from church to say, church saying, little children love one another. He was all about mending nets. Um, even James, when there was a rift in the church, if you remember the story, James is the one who spoke up and was the peacemaker uh, uh, between those that were trying to be more Judaizers to the new Gentile believers. James is the one who mended those nets, if you would. And I think that it's interesting how we even see that in their you know, pre-disciple disposition. We see that the Lord's gonna use them the way they really are in their giftings and talents. I love to see that even in our fellowship, how different people have different giftings and talents. You know, some of you are more net menders, some of you are more net casters. Um, some of you are more Barnabases, others of you are more Paul. What was the difference between them? Well, Paul was the guy who cared about the greater church and the big part of the ministry and had huge vision and direction. Whereas, you know, and, and in some ways you might say even harshly, Paul was the guy who's like, yeah, if you get in my way, get out. Like, I don't need you in my way. But Barnabas was the guy, oh, I'll take the guy that you're saying, get out of my way. Remember John Mark, who was in Paul's way, said, get that guy out of here. And, and it was Barnabas name meaning son of consolation. And that's exactly who Barnabas was. He had a more heart to just come and put his arm around John Mark and, and sort of restore him. He, you know, John Mark apparently, you know, uh, did something, ticked Paul off. Maybe it was a sinful behavior. And, uh, and, and John Mark is sort of nurtured back to health. And by the end of Paul's life, Paul even says, send to me John Mark, I wanna see him, you know? It's like the Lord used both those guys in their element. Paul, He's not the kind of guy you'd wanna be if you were caught you know, in sin or made a mistake. Paul's kind of the grand scheme and sort of the guy saying, yeah, just, I don't have time for your nonsense. Whereas Barnabas was more of a son of consolation. And, and every one of you have different you know, ways you roll. The mistake happens, by the way, when we try to force everybody to be just like us. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches we are a body that is the body of Christ. We have many members. And, and we, we roll in different ways and functions and we need to really be glad about that and not try to change everybody to be exactly like us. By the way, I made this mistake as a young pastor. Um, my favorite thing in the world to do is what I'm doing right now, teach the Bible. I love teaching the Bible. When I was younger, I thought everybody should teach the Bible because this is easy. Like it's easy and it's important and people are hungry for the word. So everybody should be Bible teachers. You're a Bible teacher, you're a Bible teacher. You're a Bible. And I, I kind of had that attitude. Like unless you're teaching the Bible, you're outside of God's will. Have you ever heard of missionaries? Remember missionaries who go around, if you're not on the mission field, you're outside of God's will. Well-spoken like a good missionary. Because <laughs> not all of us are called to the mission field like you are to Africa eating bugs and stuff like that. Not, not everybody's called to that. By the way, if you're old enough, remember Keith Green? I saw Keith Green in many concerts when I was a kid. I loved Keith Green. He was an amazing guy. Um, what did he die at? Like 28 years old, which is amazing when you think about that. But I, I kind of, I'm of the opinion, and I say this carefully and humbly, but I, I think the Lord took him home. And I'll tell you why. Because he started out just on fire and he had this great heart to reach the lost. And, and it was so good and, and he, he was effective. But it got a little weird with his last day's ministry. If you remember, um, I, I remember going to one of his last concerts and him, him making that statement, unless you're going out on the mission field, you're outside of God's will. And it got really heavy and kind of weird, honestly. If you, if you didn't see that last couple years of his ministry, you might have missed that, but it got a little weird. And I kind of wonder if that plane crash was just the Lord saying, you know, Keith, you've done an amazing thing. At 28, I need you to sing songs up in heaven. Uh, and so the Lord took him, uh, maybe. I, I do wonder about that because it got a, it, he was getting a little off course there. And it had to do with that sort of cramming what you're called to do into everybody else's thing. And we have to be careful on that one. Well, all that to say, I love this. We already see the Lord calling people to be in ministry and what's in their hand. That's what the Lord starts with. And these guys are fishermen. I love that. Um, so we see that uh, in verses uh, you know, 18 through 22. Now you also say, Brett, I don't know if I like this, where they leave their poor father there standing holding the nets with the boats. Uh, poor, you know, poor James and Andrew, or James and John's father. But one of the things you have to remember is that is sometimes what the Lord calls us to do. Remember Matthew, 
talked about this in, later on in this book, Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus said, think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I came to send, not to send peace, but a sword, for I am come to set a man at very against his father and daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. This is a heavy saying. Um, you know, and, and basically, I, and I'm not saying James and John's dad is necessarily anti-Jesus. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that sometimes you gotta make a hard call when you follow Jesus. And for some of you, it has cost you family members. If you've accepted Christ and you're walking with Jesus, you've had to kind of say, man, it's either me worshiping Jesus and being a part of the church of Jesus Christ, and my family's gonna chalk me off as a religious nut or wacko, or I just have to not follow Jesus. And, and, and I, I know a lot of people have had to make that hard decision, and it's, it's a hard one. Um, but don't be shocked when that happens. Jesus gave us that forewarning right here. And so we see this family dynamics when following Jesus. You know, um, By the way, there's some good news in that. The church can be a good family too. I hope you know that. If you've lost your you know, biological family because of your faith in Christ, um, the church of Jesus Christ can be a great family. Um, and maybe some of you have found what so many have that your church family can be more important and even more uh, caring and loving and tight than your biological family ever was. And that's one of the beauties of the church family. So all that to say, we see that. Now in verse 23, it says, and Jesus went about all of Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching, in the, uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manners of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. I love this. You know, we're getting, getting right into this. Jesus is going, and what is he doing? Well, there's three things listed here. Notice the order. I think everything in the Bible is of importance and the way things are put and the order of things listed. Notice the order here is first teaching, then preaching, then healing. And the reason I say that is because I've noticed as a, somewhat of an expert on churches, as I've gone to church all my life and studied ministries and church, I've noticed that we can get that order wrong and it really messes with the healthiness of a church or a ministry. Have you ever been to a church where healing is far and above more important than teaching? Or even preaching more important than teaching? You know, it's a funny thing. Some churches, you know, they have their healing services and they'll, you know, throw wheel wheelchairs off the stage and stuff like that. Um, you'll see that. But usually in those churches, the very thing that's lacking is the first thing on the list that Jesus was doing, and that is teaching. Uh, you know, that's doctrine, teaching solid doctrine. Uh, some churches are really big only on preaching. Preaching is, you know, preaching the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. Um, that's, you know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose from the grave, and you need to accept Christ. You need to be born again. And that's a preaching, preaching the gospel. That's what an evangelist does. An evangelist is not a church leader as much as an evangelist is someone who's preaching the gospel, sort of like Billy Graham. He wasn't pastoring a church as much as he was doing evangelistic work as a preacher. Um, but here's the thing. I think that the healthy church has all three of those elements in the order that's listed here of Jesus. And you gotta start with teaching. And I'll tell you why. Because teaching keeps us with our feet on the ground and on square, solid footing. There's nothing wacko. If we're teaching effectively, we're not gonna do a bunch of weird stuff that's not even in the Bible. Preaching is also important. Um, just if you're wondering how that works at Athey Creek, um, the way it works here is uh, on Wednesday night is our primary teaching time. But if you'll notice, I do try to teach also on Sundays. But on Sunday, I also try to weave in a little bit of preaching, if you noticed. Uh, and, and the reason I do that is Sundays and Saturdays are oftentimes where the unsaved will come and check out the church and maybe they were dragged by grandma to church and, and I'll, I'll just always, as much as I can, try to bring the, the gospel in. Remember what the author of Hebrews said? Man, you're only stuck on the milk, which is the first part of the story, you know, the gospel. But you haven't gone to the meat, which is the heavy duty teaching. And the author of Hebrews indicts the church the, uh, for, for not, not teaching and only having the, the milk, the gospel. So you gotta have both elements. I believe a good ch church that's healthy and solid will have um, the milk, the meat, and the manna. 
<laughs> that's, what, that's what I learned when I was a kid is you gotta have that in a teaching. You gotta have milk, that's the gospel. It's gotta be, every weekend I try to weave the gospel, the milk in to any sermon on any uh, weekend service. Um, but then you also have to have the meat, which is the teaching of God's word. And that's also on Sundays and Saturdays. But Wednesday night is the primary, just teaching verse by verse through the Bible, and we don't skip a thing. What about the healing part? Well, that's a part that comes later. In fact, one of the things we have to remember is to not make that the emphasis. I'm reminded of what Mark's gospel says. Jesus said this, and these signs shall follow them that believe. That is the signs of miracles and healing. But the problem is the church that follows after signs and wonders, they get it backwards. No, good solid Bible teaching, good solid preaching will then result in good solid healing. Uh, and, and we don't follow after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders will follow after those that believe. And they're supernaturally natural, I've noticed. It's not some drummed up emotional hype or d trickery to make people think they were really healed or things like that. It's actually a real bona fide healing. I believe in healing. God heals, um, and we see that here at Athey Creek. It's so cool. But it's definitely something that follows the teaching and then the preaching. So I, I think that's kind of an important thing to note. Teaching, preaching, and then healing. Those are the things Jesus was doing, and those are the things we should be doing as a church. If we're truly the body of Christ, we need to see those three elements. Well, it goes on there in, in verse uh, 24, it says, and his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him a great multitude of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. One of the things we miss, if, if you haven't been to the Middle East, you, you kind of picture Jesus just sort of hanging out there by the Sea of Galilee all the time, but this is a huge region that just was described, including all of Syria. Like if you, if you see the, the war in Syria, you see all kinds of footage from Aleppo and Damascus, and Jesus spent time up in that region as well. It wasn't divided as it is today. If you look at a map during the time of Christ, these uh, lines weren't as uh, like they are today. Uh, the lines today uh, are reminiscent of the British mandate, you know, from the um, you know early 1900s. But the the lines were very different during the time of Christ. But the Decapolis, Decapolis, uh, the ten cities. It was sort of a ten city confederation of cities that was all part of a certain region. And Jesus went, Jesus went all over the Decapolis, which by the way, would have included in much of Jordan, the country of Jordan today, uh, Jesus would have spent time there. Um, one of the things I love to do is when we go to Israel is I like to take people, it's a little bit of a hassle, but I do like to take people across the Jordan River, which the reason it's a hassle is you gotta go over a, a border crossing and it's, it takes a few hours just to get across the border from Israel to Jordan. And it, you're going into a third world country and it's definitely, you're not in Kansas anymore when you're in the country of Jordan. Uh, but there's some cool things to see, you know, Mount Nebo and Petra. Uh, but another place we go is Jarish, which is a huge city. It was a twin city of Jerusalem that was part of the Decapolis, uh, one of the 10 cities. And uh, it's just cool because you see this ancient ruin of a city that was just like during the time of Christ. But Jesus went all over that region doing all these things. So really just Matthew chapter four gives us sort of a high level view of the ministry of Christ. And we, we, we don't even really know all the details. Uh, wouldn't it have been fun to, to sort of be a, a you know, fly on the wall if you would, or you know, just be able to see what Jesus was doing all over these massive regions. But people are coming from all over the place just to see Jesus uh, we're seeing here. Now, with all that, that brings us to Matthew chapter five, which we have to kind of shift gears because we have uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Now that we, we kind of see the stage set, people are gathering from all over, multitudes are coming around to hear Jesus, to see Jesus. Jesus speaks a sermon that is important and powerful, obviously, when Jesus does a sermon. Um, by the way, this is the longest discourse in the Bible from anyone. No one in the Bible gave a longer discourse than Jesus. And it's right here in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Um, fairly close to second though is the um, Olivet Discourse that we're gonna see in Matthew chapter 24 when they ask Jesus about the end times. That's also a bunch of red letters there. But we're gonna have a bunch of red letters here because this is a sermon that's a long sermon um, but while it's the longest discourse in the entire Bible, it might just be one of the most misunderstood scriptures uh, in the Bible. The Sermon on the Mount is a misunderstood sermon, in my opinion, which by the way, all the good sermons tend to be. People like to put their own thing on sermons and what have you. I've, I've found that as a pastor. Um, but it's the highest ethical teaching in all the Bible, even beyond the law and beyond the Ten Commandments. How can you say that, Brett? I mean, the law was ethical teaching to the nth degree. Oh, but Jesus is gonna take it up from the law and even go up further still. And this is why people misunderstand the Sermon on the Mount. It's, um, it's gonna be funny, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things you're gonna see, especially after we get off, uh, through the Beatitudes, which is the first chunk of this that we're gonna look at, uh, when you get to the rest of it, you, you start to realize uh, the Sermon on the Mount is impossible. We can't do it. It's like the old timer that says, I just believe the Sermon on the Mount. Some old guy thinks he knows the Bible and he says, yeah, I just live by the Sermon on the Mount. I've heard guys say that. And I always think, no, you haven't. <laughs> it's impossible. No one, and you'll see what I mean. See, um, you have to understand, who is the Sermon on the Mount addressed to? Believers. Uh, it's kind of interesting. People that are already decided to follow Jesus. That's who his audience really is on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is not preaching the gospel. Uh, as much as that might sound weird, he's not gonna, he's not gonna uh, give a, a viewable path to salvation. He's not gonna say that I'm gonna die on the cross for your sins and if you accept me, you'll be born again. Like Jesus is not, he'll talk to other people about being saved and born again, like Nicodemus and others. But the Sermon on the Mount, shockingly, doesn't include that he, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is not gonna give the remedy or the solution to the problem of mankind. But he's gonna, what he's gonna do with the Sermon on the Mount is gonna identify the issues that humanity has. Um, and if you read just the Sermon on the Mount just and left that alone without the rest of the ministry and the life of Jesus, you might find yourself kind of depressed because Jesus is gonna say, here's the problem, but he's not as much gonna identify the solutions, not yet. Um, now, you might say, well, why doesn't Jesus identify the solution? The answer, simple, Jesus is the solution. That's the thing we have to see. The Sermon on the Mount should make you and I very uncomfortable. And, and, and if it was just left there, and then Jesus died and was put in a tomb and all that, the Sermon on the Mount would be one of the most depressing sermons you'd ever hear. But Jesus preaches this sermon, which sets the stage in the heart of man to say, whew, we're in trouble, we need help. And Jesus says, ding, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Like that's the thing we have to realize. So, so the Sermon on the Mount, it's almost like Jesus is gonna preach this heavy duty sermon and then just leave it hanging. And people hanging, thinking, oh no, what are we gonna do? When he says something like, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Is that an encouraging word to the Jews of that day? Because the, the Pharisees were thought to have been the best of the best of the best as far as righteousness. That's the kind of uncomfortable feeling you would have after hearing this Sermon on the Mount. You think, whew, none of us can do this. And that's exactly the point. So the answers are gonna come later. Um, um, and, and by the way, um, you can almost, if you would, keep in the back of your mind that remember Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. And the Sermon on the Mount is gonna be part of that equation where Jesus is gonna perfectly fulfill the law. Even what he says here, he's gonna sort of take the law, which is perfect, converting the soul in the Old Testament, and then he's gonna even clarify even greater uh, about the law. And, and um, the law, well, if you read the rest of the Bible, you realize it's, it's got a purpose to drive us to Jesus. That's the whole point. Romans chapter eight, by the way, uh, puts it this way in verses three and four, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. In other words, it didn't save anybody. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. See this little verse here in Romans, the verse says, verses three and four, kind of explains why the Sermon on the Mount is, is gonna work out okay. 
because the law never saved anybody, but it, it, was, it was reminding us of all of our need as humanity goes. And then it would be through Jesus that we would be declared righteous. And we'll see that as we go through this. So the law would be perfectly fulfilled by Jesus. Uh, the, the law will ultimately drive us to Jesus because we can't obtain righteousness or be saved by the keeping of the law. So that's the deal. That's the Sermon on the Mount. That's just kind of a high level view as we get into this. We'll probably remind you of that as we're in it more and more. But now let's divide the Sermon on the Mount because the very first part of it here is this little section, verses one through 12, is the part of the sermon we call the Beatitudes. The Beata what? The Beatitudes. Um, you mean like, uh, you know, like an attitude we're supposed to be? Yes. That's not where that word comes from though, by the way. Um, the idea of beatitudes, it comes from a Latin word, beatus, um, which is an interesting word, and this is an important word. When it says the beatitudes, it's the word beatus means in the Latin, blessed, happy, fortunate. Um, that, that is what the word beatus uh, means, both in the Latin, but also in the Greek word. The Greek word is um, makarios, which is, um, which is the word, the same word. So when, when Jesus would say, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst, um, you have to understand, he's saying happy. You'll be happy, blessed, and even fortunate if you do these things that I'm saying, these attitudes. So it is, it is a funny little play on words when we say the beatitudes are the attitudes which we are supposed to be. That actually works when you look at the original Latin word. If you wanna be happy, then you'll do what these, uh, th these things say. But it's not as much about doing as, it, as much as it is about being. We'll talk about that. In fact, um, um, what makes someone happy? Jesus is gonna teach us something that might shock you. And that is happiness doesn't come from vacation. Uh, sometimes that causes misery. <laughs> um, happiness doesn't come from an uh, amazing career and your, the watch they give you. Uh, after 30 years of faithful duty service. Uh, that doesn't really bring happiness. A lot of things promise happiness, but don't. But Jesus is gonna teach us something that's kind of shocking, that holiness, as it turns out, leads to happiness. Holiness leads to happiness. What a secret. Oh, the world misses this altogether. The world wonders, why are we so miserable? The answer, because you've bailed on holiness completely. Like most of the world could care less about what is holy or what is right before God, and they wonder why they're miserable. Jesus is gonna spell it out. What makes someone happy? Holiness leads to happiness. And I'll just add this one. Sinfulness leads to sorrow. It always does. The more we sin, the more sorrowful we are um, because the wages of sin is death. And, and sin is bad because it hurts you and messes you up. So when the Lord says, don't do this, don't do that, the sin that he says no to it, it's gonna make you miserable. But holiness, doing what we're supposed to, being who we're supposed to be. See, it's the attitudes which we're, we're supposed to be, not the do attitudes, by the way. You can write that down in your notes. Not the do attitudes, the be attitudes. Because if you look at the, the be attitudes and say, well, this is what I'm supposed to do, um, the danger with that is um, it's not just the activity, it's the attitude behind the activity. And you can see this uh, with your children. Like when you're raising kids, you see this. You know, it's, it's like my dad used to kind of try to work this within us. You know, when he'd say, you know, Brett, Jenny, Tammy, um, would you guys please wash the dishes after supper? And, you know, our knee jerk was like, okay, but we knew that was dangerous. <laughs> uh, so we didn't do it. We're like, okay, all right. No, no, my dad would say, wait, 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 wait. No, here's what you need to say. Dad, I'd be happy to. He made us say that. And then, and then if, we, if we didn't say it that way, if we said, I'd be happy to, he'd wait until you said it correctly. <laughs> not, a, not good enough for me. And he'd, want, he'd, he'd teach us to try to convince him that we were really excited. It actually became kind of a joke, you know? Oh, dad, I'd be happy to. Yeah, Cause you knew that that way you'd at least get to go to bed before midnight. Um, but it's not, the be, it's not the do attitudes. It's not just doing of it, because we can do stuff that's seemingly holy, but if our attitude is wrong, we're missing the whole point. The whole point are the attitudes which we are to be. Uh, so here we go. The Beatitudes, verse one of chapter five, says this. And seeing the mul multitudes, Jesus went up into the mountain, 
And when he was set, his disciples came to him. Now, by the way, when the Bible says mountain, you have to understand in that region, a mountain is what we would call a hill. Just, just FYI, when you go to Israel, a lot of things, you're, you're shocked at the smallness. They entered into a ship into the Sea of Galilee. So you're picture, you and I are picturing the Queen Mary, but it wasn't that. A ship was usually about 24 feet long, which we would call a river boat. In fact, you would have been more comfortable in a river boat than the boats that Jesus and the disciples were in. They found a first century fisher boat, uh, and there's a really great place there, uh, Nafganasar, uh, which is a, a kibbutz there near the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I've stayed there several times, but, but they found this uh, first century fishing boat and man, I'm surprised that, surprised that thing even floated when you look at it. But it was very, pretty small. Um, so, uh, and when it says the Sea of Galilee, you know, in Oregon, or if you're from Montana and you're living next to Big Fork Lake, uh, you can't really even see the other side, it's like the ocean. Uh, so that's what you picture, the Sea of Galilee, but it's what we might call a lake and, and, and maybe even a smaller lake at that. Uh, and so people go to Israel, they're like, this isn't a sea. It's like a puddle from Oregon. Like, it's just, but no, it, it, is, it is called the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Knesset, as it's called. But, um, but, it, but it's not that the Bible's exaggerating. You gotta re- understand, this is the language of that region. And so sometimes we, we sort of have different interpretations depending on where you live of what, what is a sea or what is a boat. Or, or what is a mountain. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, that way when you go to Israel, you think, oh, the Mount of Beatitudes is more of a hill. Um, if you're in Texas, you know, what is a hill? Uh, you know, it's an overpass going over a freeway. Or, you know, some of the, that's what I've noticed. Like, it, it's, a hill is all relative depending on where you're from. But it says here that uh, Jesus set himself, uh, when he, he was set, his disciples uh, came with him. And by the way, um, in Bible times, the teacher would sit and the listeners would stand. That was something that swapped somewhere along the way. And, and uh, at Athey Creek, we just chose to do both. <laughs> I think it's a great plan because uh, uh, we go long. Uh, and if I had to stand for all that time, it'd probably shorten the sermon. You're like, get rid of the stool. Somebody hide the stools, you know. No, we got we to keep things, get, get some work done here. So Jesus was set and his disciples uh, came to him. And by the way, when it says disciples, that not, that's not just the 12, that's the crowds that believe in him. And there was many disciples, more than just the 12. Then it says in verse two, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So really verses three through 12 here are what we call the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the rest of the, the sermon. And I thought it'd be good for us, man, you could spend, you could do a, uh, you know, a, a multi-month, you could spend a whole year teaching through the Beatitudes. Do you sense the weightiness of this? Like when I read this, I just kind of go, man, Lord, by your grace, help me to not say something stupid here. Because I mean, it just, when you just read it by itself, it's just like, whew. Um, it's powerful, it stands alone. We, we might as well just close our Bibles and say, okay, good night. Uh, we have plenty to think about, don't you, right now? Uh, well then, Brett, why don't you? Uh, because um, uh, I am a teacher of the Bible, that's what I do, and I love, I love talking about this stuff. This is so powerful. So what I'd like to do is break these uh, little uh, sections down and just, just meditate. We're not gonna exhaust this by any stretch of the imagination tonight but I would like to just spend a few minutes and meditate on each of these little sections and 
And, and think about what does it mean? Because you might, you might um, not really know unless you read the, the best commentary on the Bible, which is the Bible. And the Bible has a lot to say about these notions that Jesus is actually talking about. So let's break it down. Number one, the first thing that Jesus said is blessed are the poor in spirit. That's verse three. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, with each one of these beatitudes, I'm gonna try to identify the attitude that we are to be. And it's not an easy task, and, and I'm, I probably am not gonna do this perfectly, but this is the attitude that I see scripturally that you and I are to be when Jesus says, blessed or happy are the poor in spirit. Our attitude uh, toward ourselves in which we know our need and we're willing to admit it. Our attitude, the poor in spirit is to say, I know that I am a, I fall short. The poor in spirit, what does it mean to be in poverty in spirit? It's to understand in your heart, your, your, your own shortcomings and failures, the part of you that is in need and being willing to admit it. The Lord Jesus says, you'll be blessed if you actually get to that place. What an important attitude that we're supposed to be. Attitude to ourselves where we know our need, our shortcomings and our failures, and we're willing to admit it. One of the biggest problems in a human is pride. It's what, what pulled Satan down. But I'm gonna say this beatitude is not humility. That's not the definition. You can say, well, blessed are the humble. Different thing. Uh, hum humility is, is in some ways similar in the, the, it's part of the way you're supposed to act and a, a true humility comes from your soul. But this, this poor in spirit idea is more of a thing where you, you recognize that you are in poverty. It's not that you're just nothing or that you're not good enough or smart enough or anything like that. No, it's just you and I are in poverty. We're, we're poor in spirit and we, we have need that nothing can fill. We're, we're, we're unable to afford that which will fix us. And we admit it and we know it. That's the idea of this being poor in the spirit. You know, you, you don't have what it takes to purchase greatness. You don't have what it takes to purchase salvation. You don't have any way to make yourself better. Uh, but you, you gotta understand the Bible reinforces this over and over again. And yet what's amazing is humanity, we fight against this one more than maybe all the other Beatitudes. Maybe even in America, we, we fight this one perhaps the most because we think of ourselves as self-made people, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and, and you know, we're good people and you're smart enough and good looking enough and people like you and you got the blue ribbon and the trophy and like on and on we go. We just kind of keep building that within our, our world and it's all about self-esteem. Let's talk about what the Bible actually says. In Romans chapter three, verses nine through 12, Paul clarifies this. He says, what then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. When I hear that last phrase, nope, not one. It's almost like Paul is, is anticipating, but I'm pretty, nope, not one. But, 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 nope. See, you might say, Brett, I seek God. Nope, not even one. But I read my Bible, nope. See, there's this, there's this knee jerk where you wanna say, but, 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 but I, I'm not that bad. I seek after, no, you don't. Well, Brett, I did this morning. Well, not really, not, not the truest form of seeking because the Bible says no one's ever really done that. Like the point is, even in your best seeking, it's pathetic. You fall way short. And, and, and this sort of, you, the, the Bible is not even trying to be soft on this one. The Bible is just throwing it in our face because it's something God wants us to know that we are in poverty. We're, we're all Jew or Greek, that's everybody on the planet. We all fall short, no one uh, is good enough. And, 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 and what you have to understand is if there was anything good that you've done, let's just try to pull up and give you a little relief for a second. If there's anything good you did, that came from God anyway. God put it within you uh, to even attempt to seek the Lord. Does that make sense? Isaiah talked about this, I think, in Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, that's God, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the hearts of the contrite ones. 
The Lord says, I in my holiness am sitting high and lifted up, but it's the person who's lowly and understands their poverty that I will come down and I'll revive their hearts. Um, to be humble and contrite is something the Bible argues that we all need to actually be and that we have to become that. Romans chapter seven, verse 18, for I know that in me, Paul says, that is to say my flesh, dwells no good thing. Oh, come on, Paul, I'm sure there's something good that you did. Nope, this is Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit inspired word when Paul wrote this down. He says, I know, I, not I think, he says, I know that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So today, you know, as we talk about often, you know, this world says, you gotta have a good high self-esteem, build your self-esteem. Books have been written on self-esteem, but as it turns out, the Bible teaches kind of the opposite. One of the most sinful things human, humanity has is an exaggerated uh, sense of self-esteem. Oh, but Brett, I know people who uh, have low self-esteem. Um, did you know that the appearance of low self-esteem usually is actually the most prideful people on the planet. It's all about me and my feelings and the way I view myself. And it's all about self. That's, that's actually a weird view of self uh, that's, that's, that's twisted and contorted. The Bible says the opposite. In fact, Philippians chapter two, verse three says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. That's what the Bible teaches. Instead of thinking about your self-esteem, your little fragile sense, the Bible says, no, no, no. You think about esteeming others better than yourself. What, a, what an opposite thing. The world says, get your self-esteem all dialed in, and then you might have some bandwidth to be nice to other people. Bible says the opposite. Forget about yourself. Magnify the Lord. And then you start to see you're, you're in poverty, poor in spirit that you, you don't have the, the, the wherewithal to improve yourself, to help yourself. There's no good thing that lies within me. Paul got to that place and we need to get there as well. But good news, the Lord doesn't just leave us there in our understanding that, man, I just don't have it. But the Lord says, good, once you get to that place where you realize you're poor in spirit, that's when the Lord says, that's where I can work with you. That's where I can fix your whole life. If you wanna find life, you gotta lose your life. If you wanna lose your life for the Lord, then, then you'll find life. But if you try to find life apart from the Lord, the Bible says you'll lose your life. And that's why so many people are lost today. And it has to do with this idea of porn spirit. You know, if you get to that point where you finally say, Lord, in me there dwells no good things. I never really honestly sought you with pure holiness. I've never really, and any good thing that I've done Man, Lord, you must have put it in my heart because I'm sure it didn't come from my flesh. Because in my flesh, like Paul said, there dwells no good thing. And then the Lord will fill your life. In fact, I love Acts 17, 28, where it says, for in him, in who, not you, in him we live and move and have our being. What a powerful statement that is. When, when a Christian empties themselves of themselves, then the Lord says, I will fill you with life and life more abundantly. Bentley, in him we live and move and have our being. What's more valuable than self-esteem? Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 6.10, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. It's when we, all, when we recognize our own spiritual poverty and need, the Lord then will say, once you get to that place, then I will openly reward you richly in spirit and I'll bless you. You know, there's, a, there's a, actually a neat a little illustration. Would you keep your finger here and flip over to Luke chapter 18? In Luke chapter 18, there's the kind of the perfect analogy, I'd say, of this idea of the poor in spirit. Luke chapter 18. Jesus spoke a parable here. Luke 18, verse nine. It says, and he, Jesus, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So that's the, that's the person we're talking about. That's the opposite of, 
of the Sermon on the Mount, Beatitude number one, poor in spirit. The opposite of that is the person who trusts in themselves that they were righteous and despising other people. Perfect opposition of that. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. That's a sinner, not a, Demo uh, not a political party. Uh, just, just for you that are wondering. Um, so you got this big old sinner and a big old Pharisee. Uh, verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Notice that, that he's praying with himself. Um, he prayed with himself saying, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners and unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful unto me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What a perfect illustration of what Jesus is talking about here. The poor in spirit is the person who understands that they have nothing to offer. And they come to, to the Lord for help with nothing to offer for no reason. The, the Pharisee said, I fast all the time. You know, I give him my tithes and I'm glad I'm not like this guy over here. Like he has missed the point altogether. And, um, and uh, you know, there's nothing else the, the, the publican could do other than just recognize he was a sinner. Once you get to that place, uh, and you stop, you know, squirming, trying to prove that you're holy enough, or, you know, you gotta just die to yourself and say, I got nothing. Um, you know, it's interesting because that's where you gotta be to really get to that place where Jesus is, you know, you realize he's the perfect gentleman. Jesus does not barge his way into your life, but you gotta get to this place of emptiness and saying, I have a huge need, I'm in poverty. And when you get to that place and you say, okay, Lord, um, come into my life, I'm empty, there's nothing. Then the Lord says, that's when I'll come in. Remember, you know, Revelation talks about, behold, I stand at the door and knock, any man will open the door of his heart is the idea. Uh, if you open the door, I will come in and sup with him. That's not a salvation scripture because he's talking to the church there in the book of Revelation, if you recall. Um, by the way, you know, there's several photos. I remember there was the Sunday school version of this that I had when I was a kid. But remember all the pictures of Jesus standing at the door and knocking? Um, it's kind of an interesting thing because the original one of that uh, is kind of a funny story. It's called Light of the World, this picture that was painted in 18, uh, I think it was 1851, when William Holman Hunt painted this sort of famous picture. Um, uh, this isn't my famous, favorite version of it, but this is his picture they painted. The reason I'm, this, this is a scary Jesus. If I were a kid and I saw this, I'd be like, ah, and I'd run my, it's like, is this Halloween or what? Trick or treat? Uh, that, that's not really what I would have been. But you, you know, there's better pictures uh, that are more modern that I think are, but, um, but this picture was sort of a jolt when people saw it. And his critics, when he unveiled this at the, at the revealing of this painting that took him several years, to paint, and you'll notice the door with weeds growing up around it and stuff, vines going over, kind of interesting. Uh, but, but one of the critics came and said, you know, you messed something in your door. There's no handle, there's no door knob. There's no way to get in. And Holman Hunt said, precisely, because the door is to be opened from the inside. And it's really true. Uh, I like that. But the idea is, this is what the poor in spirit are. You get so emptied of your, just your poverty that you realize, Lord, I have nothing so will you come in and change my life and fill my life? And the Lord, he will faithfully come. He doesn't kick down the door. He doesn't knock down the door. He waits patiently at the door of your heart and he's knocking. So blessed are the poor in spirit. This does not, does not mean, by the way, false humility. We Christians become very polished on our false humility. Oh, it's not me, it's the Lord. <laughs> you know, but we really mean, look how humble I really am. Um, poor in spirit is not cowardice. Sometimes I've, I've seen where this is almost interpreted like we're supposed to be cowards. It's definitely not what poor in spirit means. Um, but it's possessing a proper attitude of, of yourself is kind of the idea. And the Bible tells us what that proper attitude is. Poverty. You and I, we don't have what it takes. We don't have enough. We can't afford it. We don't have enough talent, giftings, looks, whatever you want to fill in the blank, we don't have it. And the poor in spirit gets to a place of saying, 
I have nothing but the Lord to go to, like the, the penitent sinner that we looked at in Luke chapter 18. Now, again, I, I have to say, you know, those with low self-esteem in our world um, it shows in some, some ways you have an over-exaggerated self-esteem problem. And, and you're not willing to, you, you, you let yourself be emptied, but you don't realize where the source of help comes from. And it's not building your self-esteem. It's letting the Lord, um, you know, fill your life. Uh, by the way, when I say that, and I have to be careful about this because, you know, people are so sensitive these days. But when you have a low self-esteem self, self, self and, and the world comes and coddles you and stuff, um, you know, I wonder if, if, you, if you were really honest, if you realize that that's not hating yourself, it's actually loving yourself. Ephesians 5.29 says this, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Interesting thing. No man ever really hated his own flesh. Oh, Brett, I'm gonna disagree with the Bible. What about suicide? You know, suicide is tragic, it's so sad. And I've had friends who have taken their own lives. I remember when I was in high school, one of my buddies uh, took his life and it was a hard thing, jolted us all. Um, but I couldn't help but see in that moment how self-centered it really was. And I say this carefully and with grief in my heart, but suicide is one of the most self-centered behaviors a person can exhibit. Either it's total insanity or it's just totally self-absorbed where it's all about yourself and you don't think about the repercussions of those who love you. Nobody loves you. That's just you thinking of yourself too much. It's healthier. I, I wonder if some of the suicidal thoughts people have actually come from people cramming down their throats. So they need to build their self-esteem. And when they fail with that, they get to a place where they feel there's nothing else to do. Man, the answer is not build up your self-esteem, it's to get to the bottom and then turn to Jesus Christ, who's the one who in him we live and move and have our being. That's where the suicide person falls short. They didn't go far enough to go to where the, the solution really is. And it's so heartbreaking because, um, man, so many people miss this one. You know, um, Jeremiah 9:23. Um, kind of puts it this way in the Old Testament. I love this. Thus saith the Lord, it says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. This is it. It's not about your wealth or your wisdom or your strength. Um, it's, it's actually losing that and going to the Lord. And if you can boast of one thing, this is what you can boast of. Not like the Pharisee, at least I'm not like that guy. I tithe, I fast, blah, blah, blah. No, the only thing you and I can boast of is this, that we know the Lord and understand him. That's what it says here. This is a sort of an Old Testament precursor to what Jesus would say on the Sermon on the Mount. One of my favorite preachers of the 1800s, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, learn this lesson. And he said, not to trust Christ because you repent, but trust Christ to make you repent. Not to come to Christ because you have a broken heart, but to come to him that he may give you a broken heart. Not to come to him because you are fit to come, but to come to him because you are unfit to come. Your fitness is your unfitness. Your qualification is your lack of qualification. Well put. That's really what it means to be poor in spirit. And I think he had a way with words that there's a reason why people were stunned when he would preach these sermons. But more profound is Jesus himself, of course, saying blessed or happy are the poor in spirit. Um, and what happens to them? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what he says there. Um, the kingdom of heaven is the ultimate fulfillment of everything the Lord wants for those that are his kids. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is gonna be glorious and it's all gonna work out there. But before you get all into the kingdom of heaven, you have to make sure that you start with this idea of being poor in spirit. So number one, blessed are they that are, or blessed are the poor in spirit. Number two, uh, verse four says, blessed are they that mourn. Um, and that's verse four. What is the attitude that we're to be here? Well, if you kind of sum it up, our attitude towards sin, true sorrow 
about sin. Mourning because of your own sinfulness and you're falling short. Um, it's an attitude that we're to be. When you realize you're a sinner, uh, when you mourn over your sin, just like the guy, remember when he smote his breast and he said, oh, forgive me, a sinner. That, there was a grief involved there. When you get to that place, then you'll be blessed. What an irony. Happy are you that mourn? That's an ironic statement. Happy are you that mourn? What a strange thing. When you finally get to that place of true mourning over your sin, knowing that you've grieved the Lord of your sinful behavior. Um, there's a good example and a bad example of this. The good example, remember when Peter, after denying Jesus, um, remember how he was sorrowful? And when he saw Jesus, he, there was a, you could tell there was a grief that was sort of in him. And there was a real repentance there. The bad example of it is Judas. Um, remember Judas, when he realized he had sold innocent blood for 30 pieces of silver? And, and the interesting phrase is that, you know, he, he repented, but it doesn't mean that he was sorrowful and too, like spiritual repentance, but he realized he'd done the wrong thing. And so he took his own life suicidally. So, you know, this idea of mourning because of your sin, not just bummed that you got caught, not just realizing that you made a mistake, but true sorrow uh, in your sins. Second Corinthians seven, verses eight through 10. For though I made you sorry with a letter, Paul said, I do not repent, though I did repent. Now what's he saying here? This is Paul's way of saying, I wrote you a letter. And at first I was a little bit bummed because I thought, man, it was a little hard prickly letter that I wrote. But then I saw that you did repent. So I wasn't sorrowful anymore about that. Um, that's what he says. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it was but for a season. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. That's the key right there. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. This is Paul sort of describing something that was happening in the church at Corinth. That's sort of what we're talking about, Judas and Peter, and really what Jesus is talking, blessed are they who mourn. You gotta to get to a place where you truly are mourning your sinful behavior and, and truly coming from your heart. What's your heart like during communion? Have you ever checked that? Because you really should, so should I. You know, because, uh, you know, the Bible says there at the Passover in Exodus 12, they ate the lamb and they ate the food with bitter herbs. Why, why with bitter herbs? Why not just make some nice herbs, a little, uh, you know, Montreal seasoning and come on, put some, some salt and some prime rib rub on that thing. Let's make it taste good. Nope, bitter herbs is the way they ate it. Why? Because there needed to be a bitterness in their belly about their sinfulness. That's the picture there in Exodus 12. And the problem is some people, they just sort of wink at the, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I sinned again. Oh, <laughs> good thing it's Sunday night. Gonna have the communion. Here we go. The, here's the wine. I'm gonna drink it up and bottoms up, Lord. Sorry about it. And then you're like, good to go. Do you think the Lord honors that attitude? I call that the bragging backslider. That's all he is. There's no, there's no real repentance there. There's no mourning. There's not gonna be any blessedness either. No happiness that comes from that kind of behavior. Not excusing sin, but knowing that God actually hates sin. So we have this irony of blessed are they which mourn. Well, that brings us to number three. Blessed are the meek, verse five. For they shall inherit the earth. Who's gonna inherit the earth? What a strange thing. This is, goes back to some of the things we know that Jesus would say, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. You know, if you wanna, um, you know, uh, be great in God's kingdom, you, you gotta become servant of all. So there's a strange uh, opposite that we have to remember, but this idea of meek um, and the attitude of, of the meek is, is toward others, to be teachable, not defending ourselves, but strength under control. That's what meekness is, strength under control, an attitude that is to be teachable, not defending ourselves, strength under control. Um, meekness is not weakness. I hope you understand that. We, I think we associate that word, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. And I know that Jesus was not talking about weakness for a couple reasons. One, Moses in Numbers chapter 12 wrote this statement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which are upon the face of the earth. Can you imagine Moses writing the Bible? Okay, Lord, writing, writing, writing. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, Lord. You want me to write what? 
You want me to write that I am the meekest man on the face of it? Yep, just write it, Moses. Like, uh, that doesn't even sound meek. It's like, I, I'm remind myself of Moses, meek and humble. <laughs> but you're like, oh, that doesn't work. But the only reason Moses gets a pass on this is because we know he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, um, blessed are the meek. Um, um, so this idea of meekness. Now, it's not just Moses, it's also Jesus. Jesus made this autobiographical statement in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Uh, he said, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Um, so all that to say, meekness is not weakness. Um, uh, by the way, before we go on to this one, Jesus was not, um, you know, uh, like he was portrayed in a lot of the movies and stuff like that, uh, where he was a skinny little hippie that looked like he needed a burger. Uh, don't, don't be duped by that. Um, Jesus was probably, I believe Jesus was a fairly strong man and even looked that way because um, just of who he is and the way people followed him. And when he goes and turns the tables there in the temple, nobody says, hey, what do you think you're doing? Nobody does that. Jesus turns the tables and, and it's, like, uh, it's like, you know, people are like, uh, I'm not gonna go fight him. You fight him, I'm not gonna fight him. I think Jesus might have been more of an intimidating character as far as physically than just this little scrawny hippie guy that looks like he'd been smoking weed in his VW bus. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's the right Jesus. But, but with that said, Jesus did make this one autobiographical statement, for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest in your souls. He could have just wiped out people with not even a flick of the finger or snap of the finger. He could have just thought it. When all those soldiers came in the garden of Gethsemane and took him and apprehended him, you know, the, the people think, oh, they were taking Jesus. They thought they were apprehending him. Jesus could have just thought the thought and suddenly there'd just be pink mist. <laughs> Popping people everywhere. <laughs> like he, he could have done that. But Jesus was meek, strength under control. And he was doing, uh, you know, you might even say meekness is living for the glory of God, not asserting our own rights. That's an important thing as an American. What did I just say? Living for the glory of God, not asserting our own rights or what we think we deserve or what we think we, uh, you know, people owe us or any of that stuff, none of that. Well, all that to say, um, by the way, this idea of meekness, I thought this was funny years ago, according, according to Bill Farmer's newspaper column, J. Upton Dixon was a fun loving fellow who said that he was writing a book called Cower Power. And uh, he also founded a group of submissive people and it was called Dormats, D-O-O-R-M-A-T-S. It stands for Dependent Organization of Really Meek and Timid Souls. <laughs> and then at the end of his title it says, if there are no objections. <laughs> his motto was the meek shall inherit the earth if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> Their symbol was a yellow traffic light. <laughs> Um, you know, it is interesting. The meek are inheriting the earth, I think, even right now, whether we know it or not. The, there's a lot of people that think they're inheriting the earth, but they're actually not. David, you gotta open the curtain over here, man. I'm telling you, this sunset, I just, these people need to see it. I'm sorry. It's just one of those things that, sorry if it blinds some of you guys, but I'm sure you're okay with it, right? Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I just had to sit and look at that. <clears throat> you guys over here, you lose, sorry. It's the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen in my life, but you'll see it um, in heaven. <laughs> just, just kidding, just kidding. Anyway, uh, where were we? Oh yes, um, so by the way, some people believe Jesus failed. You know, when you think about Jesus failing in ministry, um, he didn't, he, he won the victory. And if you know the whole plan of Jesus, this is where meekness comes in. Jesus didn't assert his personal rights he laid down his rights meekly, even though he had the power to defend himself. Um, this is what this meekness is. And as it turns out, the meek shall inherit the earth. This is what Jesus said. Okay, now, the, now we've gotten through the first three of the Beatitudes. We gotta hurry up, it's 819. So <clears throat> the first three are emptying. Did you see that? Poor in spirit, emptying. They that mourn, the, the meek. But the, the next ones are filling up, if you would, uh, if you could kind of look at that. So quickly, number, uh, number four on our list, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, uh, as it says there, for they shall be filled. 
People are hungry and thirsty, but they, they, they're finding emptiness everywhere they look. Jesus gives us the secret to feeling content with life. Blessed, happy are they, and here's the attitude that we are to be if you would fill it in. Our attitude toward God is expressed. We receive his, his righteousness by faith because we ask for it. Um, the idea is, you know, we get to take the righteousness of God, that's what we hunger and thirst for, is God's righteousness. We try to fill it with everything else, but it's gotta be the, by faith when we ask for being filled. Um, you know, um, there's misconceptions. Always be good, do what's right, and then everything will work out. Well, that's not always gonna do it either. Um, hunger and thirst for the one who declares us righteous is the idea, which is imputed righteousness. God will robe you in righteousness, and that's the idea. Ble blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we know righteousness can only be found in Christ. There's no other place. Um, and by the way, um, when you, when you um, are trying to fill your life with stuff, uh, the more you try to fill it with those things like alcohol, it'll only make you feel emptier. Sex, pornography, you know, uh, greed and money, all these things that promise big, they always underdeliver. but Christ is the one who will make you literally filled. Um, what are you hungry for? You know, uh, by the way, you know what you're hungry for by when you have downtime. What do you grab when you have downtime? Do you grab the remote control? Do you grab your iPhone? Do, do you, uh, like, what do you do when you, like, with your time? Because people that are truly hungry and thirsting after righteousness, usually you see evidence of that hunger for righteousness. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 14, uh, speaks of the natural man and the flesh. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. See, the world thinks that alcohol or money or greed or sex is gonna fill them. And, and spiritual endeavors are a big waste of time. They think it's foolishness. That's, that's the natural man. But the spiritual man will realize that there's food that sustains. And like when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's where Jesus knew that spiritual satisfaction comes through the Lord himself. Um, be filled with the Lord, be filled with his righteousness. Blessed, happy are they which are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And Jesus is our righteousness. Uh, so number five on the list, um, blessed are the merciful. Uh, Matthew 5, 7 tells us this. The attitude is to have a forgiving spirit and love other people. Um, this is a pretty basic one. Uh, you know, the problem is a lot of times people struggle with this, even though we know it to be true. Have, have you ever said, I will never forgive that person? Have you ever heard someone say that? When I hear someone say that, oh, that's one of those things that I cringe because when a person says, I will never forgive that person, that means your sins aren't gonna be forgiven. That's what the Bible teaches. Um, being merciful will make you happy. Being bitter and holding grudges will make you miserable, guaranteed. It's amazing how we hang on to unforgiveness and hang on to unmerciful attitudes, but um, to have a forgiving spirit and to love people. No matter what they've done to you, you're supposed to forgive. Um, in fact, Luke chapter 23, verse 34, 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They, they parted his garment, his raiment and cast lots. I mean, Jesus did that right in the middle of their, the crucifixion. Um, the question is, if you want to obtain mercy, are you willing to forgive others? Without mercy, you're gonna keep a long list of sin and records. Hebrews 8, 12, quickly, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins will I, and iniquities will I remember no more. That's what the Lord says. So the Lord says, I will forgive your sins, but the question is, are you reciprocating that to others uh, and showing mercy to those that have sinned against you? James 2, 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. That's the key phrase there. For he shall have judgment without mercy that have showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth, rejoiceth against judgment. You gotta be merciful or else you'll be held against your own sins. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Proverbs eleven seventeen, the merciful man doth good to his own soul. This is what Jesus is saying. 
but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. And Jesus said, shockingly, in Matthew 6, uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount that we're gonna see next Wednesday, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Listen, plain and simple, you gotta forgive. Every time, all the time. Anytime you decide not to forgive someone, you are putting your soul into not only spiritual danger, maybe even eternal danger. I mean, I know we, we can talk about once saved, always saved, lose your salvation. Let's not get into that, but scary enough verses in the Bible, if you ask me, that if you're unforgiving, then God says, well, I won't forgive you then. And that puts you in a real bad spot. <clears throat> so don't do that. Um, why should I f forgive them? They're all jerks. The answer, because you're also a big jerk. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the Lord forgave you. <clears throat> I'm trying to make it simple for some of you guys. <laughs> I, I, I want to make it simple for you guys. Um, number six, blessed are the pure in heart. Uh, Matthew 5, 8, this is great. And the attitude, keeping our lives and motivations clean. It's not just staying clean practically, but the motivation behind it's the pure in heart is the idea there. Um, you know, holiness, like I said earlier, leads to happiness. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us about our hearts. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things who, uh, and desperately wicked, who can know it? That's the definition. By the way, this is a scripture I like to reserve when I talk to my Mormon friends, because if you sort of defend your, your position against a Mormon doctrine biblically, where they used to, I don't hear this as much anymore, but they used to say this all the time. Do you remember when they'd say, but I had a burning in my bosom. Uh, that was a Mormon thing. I had a burning in my bosom. And so that's how I know it's true. And you can say whatever you want, but I know in my bosom. Okay, your bosom. Let's talk about your bosom here for a second. <laughs> when your bosom, what are you talking about? Well, it's your heart, right? Your heart, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's in my heart. I have this. Well, the Bible says this, the heart is deceitful and above all things and desperately wicked. Should you really be following your heart on this one? Because that's really a bad idea. I don't want to follow the, the, the heart. I want to follow God's word. But that's important. Psalmist on this one said in Psalm 51:10, created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Um, so, so this, you know, this idea of blessed are the pure in heart, man, this is something we only can get from the Lord as well. It comes from the Lord. You gotta empty your heart full of its sin and say, Lord, created me a clean heart. Uh, and then if you do that, you'll see God. Did you know it says, uh, you know, our sin is sort of blocking our view of who God really is. When we, when we look at this pure in heart one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Number seven, we're almost done. Blessed are the peacemakers there in verse nine. The attitude to that is to bring peace between people and God and those that are at odds with one another. Are you a peacemaker or do you like to stir up trouble? Some of you are troublemakers. Others of you are peacemakers. Um, when you walk into a room, do you think people go, oh, peacemaker or troublemaker? Uh, some of you, you have to kind of take a hard look at yourself because Jesus said you'll be blessed, happy, if uh, you are a peacemaker. My dad used to use that, Brett, be a, remember to be a peacemaker. And most of the time he was referring to helping get along with my sisters, <laughs> Jenny and Tammy. Brett, be a peacemaker. I remember one time Jenny and Tammy were arguing and I was just watching the fireworks having a blast. <laughs> this is great. And my dad said, kids, stop for a second. Brett, go to your room. What was that? I remember I had to learn this lesson. And, and when, I, when, I, when my dad got into explain why he sent me to the room, the reason, I wasn't being a peacemaker. I was enjoying conflict. <laughs> and I think my dad sensed that. Um, I did that, learning to be a peacemaker was something. My sisters, uh, I shouldn't even waste our time, but um, I loved playing cowboys and Indians and war and stuff like that when I was a kid. But my, once in a while, my sisters would win and we'd play girl stuff like Office. I remember, I remember when I was six, Tammy was seven, Jenny was eight. And they'd go into the room and on Jenny's side of the bed, they had this, you know, kind of this double sized bed that they both slept in. And on Tammy's side, she'd have a little office, Jenny's side, and they'd stuff me under the bed with all the spiders and cobwebs. And I was sort of the memo transfer person, you know? <laughs> it's like, they'd stuff me under there and they'd, they'd write memos and fill forms and they'd, you know, like sort of fax them or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> I hated that game. So I, so, so I, uh, 
So I got frustrated and one of the memos came by and so I, I covertly wrote, uh, Jenny was sending Tammy a message. So I wrote, um, there was a little note from Jenny and then at the bottom I, I wrote, I said, P.S. Tammy, I hate you. <laughs> and then I passed it to Tammy. And Tammy proceeded to jump out of her, be, or her uh, seat in her little office and marched right to my dad and handed him the note. And I was one of the top five spankings I received, I remember. Uh, it was horrible because hate was not a word we were supposed to use. And I was not being a peacemaker between Jenny and Tammy. <laughs> Romans 14, 19, let us follow after the things which make for peace uh, and things wherewith may edify or build up one another. Romans, uh, whoops, uh, Romans, uh, where are we at? Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. And if you do that, you'll be called the children of God. Funny how I remember that one with my sisters in, in the context of my parents. Because that's kind of the thing. If you want to be one of the sons and daughters of God, you're going to be a peacemaker. Last but not least, blessed are they that are persecuted. Uh, the attitude, all who live godly lives will suffer persecution. It's an attitude that we're supposed to have. Uh, of, really of expectation, knowing that this is probably gonna happen if you're living godly. But happy are you if you're persecuted? Yep, it's one of those ironies of Christianity. Um, in fact, um, you know, it's funny where um, the expectation is all who live godly uh, will suffer, but, um, but suffering leads to joy. That's something the Bible kind of talks about. Um, and this is a promise, hang this one on your mirror, 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You got the church at Smyrna that suffered persecution, but a sweet fragrance came from that church. Crushing through fragrance is kind of an amazing picture there. Um, and it says in verse 11, it kind of gives us a little more information. It says, um, and, and about all those people who say false things of evil against you. And, and the key here is falsely. Um, some Christians try to do stupid things and say, well, I'm just being persecuted. Um, like you're, you're at work witnessing when you should have been working and then you're saying, well, I'm just being persecuted. Nope, you're, you're just being a bad worker. Don't, don't confuse persecution for just being stupid. Um, that's something we have to remember too. Uh, I would say this more carefully if I had time, so I'm just going the fast version. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> what happens if it's false and you're doing things right? Well, then you rejoice, verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad if you're being persecuted. Is that what happens when you feel like you're being persecuted? I'm excited, I'm, ex I'm happy. That's what it says, for great is your reward, where? In heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Persecution, there's benefits, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction is but for a moment, but it works for us a far more exceeding weight, eternal weight in glory. That's heaven. Romans 5, 3 and 4 says, not only so, we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulation work of patience, patience experience, and experience hope. So we have these things where we um, are truly blessed as people, even when we're persecuted. Jesus said, happy are you. And this is something that's proven out to be uh, historically true as well. Again, I would refer to Fox's Book of Martyrs uh, and re remind you that there, there's people that died persecuted, but they had joy on their faces, even as they were suffering for Christ's name. And I, I think that's something we should remember. Boy. I'm sorry to race through the attitudes that we are to be, but could you meditate on this the rest of this week? Really go through these and pray through this stuff because man, it's not about the attitudes, the do attitudes. These are the be attitudes, the attitudes that you and I should be. May the Lord give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. Lord, tonight as we close up our Bibles, we're thankful for the work that your word does on our hearts. Um, Lord, these, these are lofty goals, but um, we get a real sense of emptying out ourselves, Lord, just emptying all the things we think we have, the things, the things we think are good or think we have to offer. Lord, we wanna empty ourselves before you and I pray you'd fill us with your goodness and that, Lord, that happiness would come through righteousness. Um, Lord, I pray that we'd, we'd live this out and be these people. Lord, we, um, we know that in our flesh lies no good thing. So even if this is possible, it has to come from you. So give us strength, Lord. Would you do this in our hearts? Work your will in our hearts and our lives. In your church, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.